Welcome everyone to Meet Your Care Team. We're extremely privileged to have assembled a, an expert and very profiled care team, including a medical oncologist, a surgeon, a nurse navigator, and a psychosocial expert. This session is designed to help you to understand who each person on your care team is and how they best support you on your cancer journey and how you can work towards building an excellent relationship with each of them. Um, I'm going to do some introductions. Uh, we'll hear from various different uh, speakers today and at the end we'll have a general discussion and there'll be an open opportunity for you to ask questions as well using the question feature on this platform as well as the chat feature. So please, the chat's being monitored. Any comments or questions, please uh, please feel free to, to, to do so. First, let me introduce Connie Pickett. She is a two times cancer survivor, a mom of three, an artist, and a certified life coach and wellness counselor. She was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer in 2018. She has been through the full gamut of treatments, surgeries, radiation, and chemo, as well as continuing to experience the side effects of all of those treatments. She understands the physical and emotional toll cancer can have on someone and has chosen to support others through their journey as a peer support mentor with Colorectal Cancer Canada and as a counselor. Natalie Leon uh, is a, she had made her professional debut and I have to, I, I had a small laugh, Natalie, when I read that a professional debut <laughs> into the world of oncology. Um, it started with her role as a nurse clinician in the Jewish General Hospital Cancer Nutrition Rehabilitation Program with the aim that the team work with the patient and their caregivers to improve the nutrition, physical function and overall quality of life of an, of an individual led to her in transition into her current role as a nurse navigator, or, as, or what we like to call the orchestra leader. Um, in this role, she continues to work closely with her medical partners to help patients understand their personalized care plans while providing symptom management and psychosocial support throughout the cancer care trajectory. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Baptiste, who is the former chair of the McGill uh, University Department of Oncology and director of the McGill Center for Translational Research in Cancer. A major award from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation led to the expansion of the center and its integration into the Siegel Cancer Center at the Jewish General Hospital, which he also directs. Dr. Baptiste is a clinician scientist trained in medical oncology and molecular pharmacology. In 2014, he co-led a successful application that resulted in the establishment of the Canadian National Centre of Excellence in Personalized Medicine, Exactus Innovation. The core feature is a program uh, to build a massive biobank and database linked to prospective longitudinal registry of cancer patients followed through the trajectory of their illness, a project called personalize my treatment. Uh, Dr. Mary, Lu uh, Mary Lise Buchos is a staff colorectal surgeon at the Jewish General Hospital and associate professor of surgery at McGill University. She treats colon and rectal cancers, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticular disease, fecal incontinence, and all anorectal disorders. Dr. Buchos is the program director of the colorectal surgery residency at McGill. She also leads the uh, <clears throat> uh, JGH McGill colon and rectal surgery outcomes research program that is focused on innovation and outcomes uh, research. And, and certainly last but not least, we welcome Christina Cabral. Uh, Christina is a social worker, psychotherapist, and couple and family therapist. She holds a master's degree in social work from McGill University, as well as a postgraduate degree in couple and family therapy from the Jewish General Hospital. For over a decade, Christina has worked with cancer patients and their loved ones at the Jewish General Hospital, helping them to cope with all stages of their illness. 
Now, I had said earlier to my colleagues, we've only got 40 minutes with this session and to have this kind of an illustrious profile of people, we're going to move fairly quickly through this session. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Connie uh, to provide some opening uh, comments um, and to tell us a little bit about her story. Thank you. Um, you know, looking back on this process, uh, I definitely can say that there was a constant theme taking place, right? It's who do I see next and how long do I have to wait? Everyone's situation I know is different and we can't always control the wait times. Um, but knowing the process and understanding what's next would have really helped me with that overwhelm and that constant anxiety that I felt going through it all. There are so many doctors and specialists involved, as you can tell from even those here today, um, that it's hard to know who do you even go to with your questions. There's the you know, MRIs, there's CTs, there's PET scans, there's blood work, there's everything in between. Um, you have so many on, on this team and if you have a surgeon, you know, what is, what is their role and, and what if you don't have surgery, who follows you then? So there was a lot of questions I had, um, throughout it all. I have since learned to advocate, um, but we know as, as health professionals that anxiety does play a huge role in all of this in what we retain as a patient. I know it did for me. Um, I thought that once I left those meetings with my doctor, um, everything made sense until I processed it. So the information, once it's sunk in, you have those questions and you don't always know who to ask because you don't know the next phase. So as patients, as I mentioned, we do need to advocate for ourselves because there's a huge mental health component to it. And we also need to trust the process. That's why I really do think it's important um, to take the time as we are today to get to know our care team and each of their roles to help uh, alleviate some of that uh, stress and anxiety that comes with you know, a waiting game and what's next. Thank you so much, Connie, for setting it up so beautifully. So I think that's a great transition into Natalie and our orchestra leader. First, Natalie, you'll, I'd love you to talk a little bit about the role that you perform, but how common is your role? Do we see this? Is this unique to the Jewish or is, is there more of you? Um, there's more of me, but unfortunately not enough of me. Uh, the reality is, I am what you would refer to as a nurse navigator across Canada. In Quebec, I'm known as an infirmière pivot or an IPO nurse. And um, patients do, as Connie articulated beautifully, benefit from being connected with me. I'm what you would call a resource person throughout your cancer care trajectory that can help answer those questions and clarify and demystify uh, who are all these team members that you meet throughout your cancer journey? Uh, I act as a bridge of coordination, not only of your care, but of communication between yourself and your medical team and amongst the medical team to let them know where you are in your cancer care and if any issues are occurring that need to be addressed. My main points of my role basically are to assess the needs of the patient that are diagnosed with cancer, colorectal cancer, to provide teaching and educational material when needed to best support their needs. I also act as a, um, I'd like to say as a support, support not only for the patient, but for the family, because the family members are also going through this cancer diagnosis that the patient has now learned they have. And I also help finally to help coordinate care with the main goal being the optimal quality of life that a patient should experience during cancer treatment. I am one of many resources that are available for patients, but unfortunately, it's not always um, identified early on in the cancer chair trajectory. Other resources that are equally important in the cancer care, a nutritionist, 
because we do know nutrition is important during uh, and post receiving chemotherapy treatments or any kind of cancer treatment. Um, healthy eating habits need to be established early on and a registered di dietitian can be implicated into a patient's care profile to consult when needed to optimize their nutritional elements of their diet. Another important um, role that sometimes gets sidelined or comes in later on, but can be introduced early on in a cancer care trajectory is the supportive care team, also known as palliative care team. The word palliative care tends to be scary to patients, but what it's important to understand is that this team is a specialized team of professionals that are there to help support patients with a chronic or serious illness during their treatment. Supportive care is to enhance. They have a lens of enhancing the quality of life and focusing on what needs to what changes need to be made to promote that quality of life during um, a cancer illness. They can be mm -hmm. implicated at any stage during your treatment. It's important to highlight that it's supportive care can be concurrent with curative treatment and they can help target and focus areas uh, otherwise that might not get that specialized attention that we need during an illness. For example, management of pain, which is a big symptom. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, how your role came to be? Uh, how long you've been in the role? Um, some of the ways it's creating itself as it feels like it might be a relatively new earth thing within the it's, cancer system? It's a newer thing for me. Uh, I've been in the role for about three and a half years. Um, but it is something that is very familiar, as I said, across Canada and in Montreal and Quebec. Uh, it, it is, it's, it's a specialty role because you do have to have a broad lens to address every need and every facet of a patient during their out their trajectory. And it's, mm -hmm. it's also a very humbling role because I find that the ability to help patients when they do need support at their most trying times, it, it's an honor to be part of that process to then help alleviate some of the anxiety when, when needed. Thank you very much. I'm going to bridge briefly into um, uh, uh, Dr. Batista. Uh, I'll start with you and to discuss a little bit more about what you do, how you support pa patients, and when in the process people have access to you. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be part of this. I think this is an ex excellent oh. initiative. <clears throat> I'm a medical oncologist, which means that our treatments are designed to be systemic. Uh, it's, it's not cutting something out or irradiating a pinpoint thing, but uh, a, a treatment that's going to circulate I I in the body. And uh, most often in a, in, in a setting where we either uh, are, are concerned about residual tumors, like after surgery, we call that adjuvant chemotherapy to kind of mop up a sort of guarantee, or in the case of evident metastatic tumor, where there are tumors elsewhere. Uh, but we need, um, uh, uh, when I say we're not, we're not focused, it's, we're not a precision uh, tool like, like surgery or, 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 or radiation, we're now in a world of precision medicine where we're not uh, aiming so much at uh, using uh, generic toxic chemotherapies, but trying to characterize the tumors much more specifically and choose the treatment that's going to be very specific to what's driving the tumor's growth. So that's what a medical oncologist does. But I think that the theme that you've, uh, you're already hearing now is that uh, this, this word trajectory is not simple in the case of opt best cancer care. We always aim for best cancer care. Um, and, and it isn't a, a simple line. Uh, we can draw uh, from beginning to end uh, all the different uh, people, as Connie said, that, that she has to interact with, but they, they may be uh, cutouts. They might come in and come out. I might be there in what we call neoadjuvant uh, therapy before surgery and then come back after surgery. 
uh, the, the surgeon, you'll hear Dr. Boutros might be there to make the diagnosis at colonoscopy to do the surgery, but then also to do follow-up colonoscopies or, or stomal care. Or, or, uh, so we, we, we are trying to, and appreciating that this is not a simple straight line, a so-called trajectory that we can draw, but it also requires precision. And each individual patient um, will have a different kind of trajectory and it'll change over time on the, on the basis of uh, the, the, the behavior of the tumor and the tolerance of the treatment. And so I think we're starting to understand as we develop in a project here to really understand the trajectory and help patients to be able to anticipate, again, an issue mm -hmm. of what's coming next, to better kind of describe it as a series of functions that are available to you that can be brought to the table by uh, someone like Natalie, who is available, aware of them all as well. But if the patient knows all of the different pieces that are available to him or her, I think uh, I think that's going to make it a little bit more um, empowering, which is very important mm -hmm. to us. Um, yeah. And for patients. Good. I want to come back to what I call the entire puzzle and the whole team concept. Um, I think we'll, what I'll do is next go to uh, Dr. Dr. Boutros and ask the same question. Can you just share with us, you know, what you do when a patient has access to you um, and how you best support patients? Sure. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real honor. Um, I'm a colorectal surgeon. And so, um, as Dr. Battis mentioned, sometimes I meet the patient you know, when they're referred for um, a screening colonoscopy or if they have bleeding per rectum, for example, and I'm working them up. And so I could be making the diagnosis. I could be the first one to share the diagnosis um, with the patient and their family. So that's one place where I meet uh, patients. Um, I also sometimes meet the patient um, once they have been diagnosed and then um, to sort of spearhead their um, surgery treatment and figure out the sequence of their treatment with the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist. My job's really to get rid of it, take it out. Um, and I love doing that. Um, and I'd say a big part of my job is figuring out how to best um, achieve our goal of cure, number one, while um, preserving quality of life and function and to really get to know the patient and what their goals are, because my goals might be different from what a, what a patient's goals are. Some people, you know, we have we all have different goals. And so to get to know the patient well and see, well, is it quality of life that matters? Is it being 100% sure that they're rid of the disease that matters? What is it that matters to them? Um, and to work with the rest of the team to achieve those goals. Um, and to be really transparent at, about what our treatment expectations should be. Um, and what the timeline should be, and what recovery from surgery should be. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll discuss more as a team, but that's my role. Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of a whole team concept, and uh, so we again, we'll come back to that. And um, I'd like to now just pass it over to Christina, and essentially the same question, which is just tell us a little bit about your role. When do pe uh, patients get to see you? So thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm a social worker in uh, oncology, and I'm so glad um, that we're, you know, bringing together the psychosocial aspects of care as well. Um, so I help people and their families um, cope with their illness at various stages. So whether it be at diagnosis, during treatment, uh, post-treatment, um, you know, also at end of life and bereavement. Um, so it really depends on what the person and the family needs um, at that specific time. So the, the way that we uh, work is by first conducting an assessment to identify what the needs are and really understand, you know, how, how can we help this person and their family. Um, so I provide, uh, that could be providing counseling to patients and their families, uh, which includes either individual or couple or family counseling to help them cope with the emotions that can come um, with cancer, the fears, the anxiety, the worries, sadness, uh, anger, any of the emotions mm -hmm. uh, to help family members talk to each other about the illness. 
um, to help with, you know, maybe explaining to their children if there's young children, um, really the, the emotional aspects of coping. Um, and then there's also practical aspects that are very important to people um, and, and very real stressors um, along the cancer journey um, that social workers can help with. So one example is um, helping people access financial resources. We know that uh, cancer can have huge financial repercussions on people. So it could be pointing people in the direction of government financial programs they could be eligible for or um, making applications to private foundations. Uh, other practical concerns could be transportation, how to get to the hospital for treatments if, if they're alone or they can't drive or whatever reason. Um, also helping people and, you know, this is where some of the, the roles are, um, you know, we, we all work together to refer um, to other teammates. So uh, whether the person may need a referral to a community organization uh, like Hope and Cope or to the CLSC for home care services, for example, or uh, referrals to the professionals that we work with, um, like uh, in psychiatry, in psychology, or all the different members of the team, like an occupational therapist. So we help people um, access the services that they need and also advocate for them. Um, and another, you know, huge component, especially uh, if you're hospitalized if, of the social work role is to help people with discharge planning. Uh, they may need services at home once they leave the hospital. In some cases, people may need placement. So it's, you know, helping to orient people um, and figure out what would best support them at that time. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting about your role, Christina, is I think it, it covers from beginning to end it, it and, and back again. It's less defined in terms of where you are in your journey. So, yes. um, yeah, that, that must be one of your big challenges. I, um, you know, Connie, I want to go ask you a, a question, which was, did you have access to this kind of coordination as part of your, your care journey? Did you have experience um, with a team like this? No. Yes and no. Um, throughout the process, you know, as Dr. I think Batiste mentioned, is people do come in and out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, having everyone here today, I can honestly say, oh, that I didn't even realize the hospital had um, a nurse navigator. Uh, I got that at the very end. Maybe I could have asked now that I know of when that comes into play and can I have my nurse navigator now instead of at the end um, or even social work. I had no idea that um, the hospital had one and that it's not necessarily just the counseling portion of it, but the practicality of, of living with these challenges throughout the different stages, you know, especially even when you have an ostomy, um, it's just assumed, you know, once you're discharged, what happens with having an ostomy? You know, how do you, where do you even get the supplies or how do you, how do you afford them if you're self-employed? Uh, well, I now know I could have went to the social worker um, or even my nurse navigator to help me figure that stuff out maybe even before I left the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. if I advocated for myself more, maybe I would have known, but I was one of these people who was um, very much in fear to some degree throughout like the this majority process. of people. <laughs> I dissociated. It was like, yeah, I'm good. What's next? Just get this out. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, slowing it all down now has um, really made a difference in, oh, I wish I wish I knew. So this is fantastic. I, mm. I really think it's gonna help a lot of people. So Natalie, can you walk us through how this works? If I'm new to a diagnosis and I come to the Jewish, what happens to me? How do I, as a patient, know what to ask for, what to expect. I love how um, Connie set it up. How do I know what's next? 
Who's got my plan of action happening? Your plan of action actually is at many various points in, when, uh, when you've come into the system. Uh, primarily, the first patient that meets a doctor tends to be the one that we refer to me. I then will do a telephone assessment or an in-person or even now with modern technology, virtual, so in the comfort of your own home, with other family members primarily in, so they can integrate and questions can be asked and we can identify early what needs are the priority and an action plan. Mm -hmm. Once a patient mm -hmm. meets with their medical oncologist or their surgical um, doctor, and I have awareness of what the plan is, I can then answer the questions for the patients to help guide them and their expectations of what's coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Boutros, Dr. Batista, I understand that you're advocating um, uh, quite, quite vehemently for um, whole care teams. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? These are very all centered around conversations on, on patient care. Uh, how does that look? What does that mean? How is it different at uh, your hospital? I can. Uh, I, I would. I think. I mean, I'll be uh, brief, and and, and then uh, Marilise uh, has perhaps even more to say about this. I would just. There. I think that there, there are three elements um, just in the communication part of this that's important for the patients. One is, um, as we as we said, just a menu. Having Connie know from the start all of the various things that are available to her at, at, that could be brought into the into play at any time based on on needs and the second thing i think and this is i think uh, in, um, taken for granted by us but um it, it is not it's critically i think important to the patient is it, it, is to know that we communicate with one another to understand that all of these players actually talk to each other so for you know t last night a patient was finally going to start radiation therapy today and there's some chemotherapy that goes along with that and because the schedules in part because of the pandemic are a little bit shuffled we didn't know when to start i got a text from my colleague in radiation oncology last night and the patient you know was able to start today and so we communicate with each other natalie and i communicate all the time and so i think that's important to know that we all talk to each other and the third thing is uh, the information that we give you, we we have we understand that not uh, all all people, not just patients, not all people uh, uh, use information in the same way to make decisions, and so uh, Natalie's kind of cutting through that by having in her first intake the whole family there because we know that there are people who. Um, want to get information and can ask questions there are people who want their partner to ask the information and they'll get it from them uh later they want to there are people that want to watch a video there are people that want to read things people take in information in different ways and we're starting to understand that one of our colleagues is a scientist who studied that and so we're trying to provide information even the same information in all these different formats um, and in particular, a, a video about systemic therapy that patients can take home and replay and replay with their spouse and friends and, and come back with specific questions. So I think those three elements on communication are extremely important. Mm. Mm. Not I'm sorry. Yeah, no, don't apologize at all. Dr. Bruchos, what would you, can you add to that? And the concept of... What what one of the things that I, I heard that is very intriguing is the idea that not only are you communicating internally, you're asking the patient in their quote unquote ecosystem, their family, to communicate as well. So it's not person to person anymore. There's there's almost like teams of people who are working together for the betterment of the patient. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I I agree, and I, it's quite iterative. 
because as they receive more information, more questions come up. Um, and so I echo what Dr. Battis was, was sharing that it's iterative and uh, there's constant communication between um, all the specialists and Natalie is really the glue amongst us and helps us with that. Um, and sometimes we just need to, after the, we, after the patients and their families have had a chance to digest, we have to rehash it again and again. Um, it's typical for a patient who isn't, won't have a straightforward treatment, just surgery alone, for example, but if they have multimodal treatment, which most patients will need for colorectal cancer, that we meet them several times before the final um, treatment path is, is decided. So mm -hmm. it's an iterative mm -hmm. communication process for sure. Mm. Right. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the role, Christina, that you would play is because your role covers so many of the stages of a patient's journey, where in fact do you step into the process? Or that's got to be different each and every time. That's right. It's different each and every time, depending on what the people need. Um, to Connie's point, you know, a lot of people, when they're during having treatment, they're on survival mode. They're just getting from one treatment to the next. And, you know, it's like maintaining weight, uh, doing the treatment, making sure not to get an infection and, you know, all, all of the things that they need to do to get through the treatment. And then it's afterwards that they say, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm not well emotionally. Um, I need help. So, you know, that's very common. So for somebody, it, you know, it could be when they're done their treatment. For other people, it could be right at the time of diagnosis when they're in complete shock. Um, and so it really depends on what the person needs. Um, and people will come to me mostly referred by uh, their doctor, by their um, IPO nurse, um, sometimes by other allied health professionals like physiotherapists or occupational therapists. And people can also refer themselves. So that's uh, for everybody to know, you know, they can call uh, the social services department at the Jewish General mm -hmm. Hospital and ask to speak with a social worker. So it really, you know, people get impacted in different ways um, at different points throughout their illness. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. So tell me, is this a fairly unique program that's happening at the Jewish? Um, is it more advanced than others, if I could use that language? Do you see this as becoming a standard of care? Where is this concept of whole team? Um, and how do case cancer patients today know if it's available to them? How do they even ask for it? I think I think in general these kinds of uh, these kinds of teams are built in pieces, and then the ultimate step really is starting to really listen to the patient and recognize how dizzy the patient feels, and 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 then try to integrate them. And it, some pieces of it are more naturally uh, closer together in their in their origins and how they work, and and so then it becomes a a, a real function a. a, a proactive kind of uh, activity to try to bring them together and, and create better communications. We're, our, our idea really is that this, you know, this should pertain to all, all health related issues and should extend out to the community when people are first pre presenting with symptoms, not just within the hospital system. Um, and so we're, we're working in a larger kind of context on the concept of trajectory, but really uh, putting the pieces together and building mm -hmm. dashboards can actually build a, a, a models for each very personalized kind of models of trajectories and, and make mm -hmm. the communication stronger, mm -hmm. but mostly I'll provide tools that are easy to use uh, to patients so that they can see the whole map and, and fit it together themselves. So I think, you know, there are wonderful systems in other centers around the world that are doing this. This is a, this is a goal for us. And um, so uh, it, it's something that we're proud to be spending the energy right. trying to do. So this is definitely, I'll use the word trend, um, that is evolving, that is coming into its own, um, and that cancer patients today can be the beneficiary of as time evolves. Is that a fair statement? 
at long last, right? <laughs> it's something that was needed and that we're finally recognizing it, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if I could um, add just really quickly, I think it's sorry. important that patients know that they're active participants in their cancer care and their planning because sometimes patients sit back and they're afraid, they're intimidated to voice their concerns or to ask questions. And I think what we can pride ourselves on at the Jewish General Hospital is that we've promoted that the patient's voice needs to be heard. And we mm -hmm. wanna hear what you're feeling, thinking, so we can help you with those situations. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Connie, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, definitely a, a point we need to really, um, you know, uh, strengthen here is that the voice is important. It's also important to know that, um, you know, there are people also behind the scenes that once I learned that I felt better about. For instance, I had no idea that my surgeon talked to all these other people um, through a tumor board that, I mean, I didn't know that till later when I was going, okay, what's taking so long? What's going on? I, I, I want this process to move forward. So learning that, yes, I, my communication was just with my surgeon at that point, but my surgeon was actually communicating with so many others. And um, when he didn't, or was unsure, he would go, oh, you know what, I want to take it uh, to the next one. So-and-so was missing and I, I don't want to move forward without this vital um, person in the room. That was really reassuring to know that, um, I, not that I didn't trust him, the surgeon, <laughs> but just knowing that it's a group, it's a team and I appreciate everyone here today and us learning that it is a team effort, but also there's so many others on the team too that were in that room. This that is a critical advance from the last century where there was one doctor, usually a, a man, um, who was making all the decisions uh, in, uh, on his own. And, and so you're highlighting this is extremely important. We work in teams and we're evidence-based. And so we, we, we not only are reading the literature and following it, we generate the literature, we measure what we do, our outcomes, and we use that in order to try to improve because you're never optimized. And I should add that a big part of standard care for us is also uh, clinical research and access to novel, op novel therapeutic opportunities. That's part of standard of care. But there is a lot of uh, uh, evidence-based aspect to it, and it is a community practice. We, we communicate together. So I think that's a very important insight that you brought, and that's something that's critical. Yes. yes. And to, to the point of, oh, sorry, to what um, no, Lily was saying, I think people often forget that they do have a voice, you know, and we're there to remind them. Like, they'll come to me and say, oh, I'm feeling this and this and this way about what the doctor proposed. Well, did you share that with the doctor? Oh, no, I didn't. And, you know, I remind people, yes, share this with the doctor, share how you're feeling. You're going to get an explanation about why this approach or that approach and what specialists were consulted. And I think, you know, uh, we've evolved out of that hierarchical, you know, one doctor, as you said, Dr. Bat is making all the decisions and one patient, but some patients are still thinking that that's the mode. So it's important to remind them, you know, that they have a voice and that their voice is central. Can I build on that as in the final minutes, minutes that we have left, Christina, because I think it's a critical point outside of what I call a team effort. There's an issue called relationship. You know, what is, if we could just go around the table, what is the number one thing that a patient with cancer can do today to build a strong relationship with their care team? What's the single most thing that you each feel they can do to build relationship? Christina, do you mind if I start with you? Sure, I mean, I would say that it would be to just bring forth their thoughts and their concerns because a lot of times 
people, um, you know, doctors have no idea or nurses what patients are thinking if they don't say it. And for many reasons, they may not say it, um, you know, cultural or just life experience or fear. <laughs> Everybody's very scared at this time. So um, I think it would be just to share what their thoughts and feelings are um, in order to, to then open the dialogue. And, and to it also helps you know establish a trusting relationship where then it becomes more comfortable to share this kind of information. Thank you. Dr. Boutros, what would you say? I totally agree is not to be shy, not to withhold, um, kind of like we were saying earlier, when you're not sure about what the next step is or why you haven't received a phone call in two months. I just went over this with a patient earlier this week, you know, where our office didn't reach out for whatever reason. Just call, communicate, come by if we're not, you know, getting back to your messages. We want to hear from you. We know that if you're reaching out, it's because you have a question, a concern, you're anxious. Um, and so I would just say to be forthcoming and um, not to be shy or be straightforward and honest with us about what your goals are and how we can help. Um, so there's nothing that burdens us. I'm happy to hear everything people have to say. And um, often patients are like, we know that there's a lot of people out there. I don't want to take your time. You're not taking our time. We're here for this. Um, and you know, our cancer patients are our most precious patients that we see and we understand what they're going through. So I just say to be forthcoming, honest, and bring on the questions and contact us frequently. Thank you. Dr. Baptiste? Ditto. I think for me, the most important thing is for the patients to ask, ask questions. I actually insist patients, at least in a first meeting, ask me at least three questions. Uh, it's, uh, and more if they want to, but at least three. So I, 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 I agree with everything that's been said. Okay, thank you. Natalie? Bring your support team to the table for the discussion. Often we have caregivers, other family members, they're going through that cancer journey with you and mm. they have questions also. We welcome the questions, not only from the patient, but from the perspective of the caregiver, because sometimes through discussion, we've identified issues that are occurring or ways that we can help support the caregiver to also support the patient. So I, I, I encourage everybody to come yeah, to the table for great. that discussion. Great. And Connie, I'd like to give the last word to you. Um, this is exactly what we need, really, is, is being mm -hmm. able to know your team so that you feel uh, confident in this journey that you are taking care of. Mm -hmm. Great. And you know what's next. Thank you so much to everybody part, who participated uh, it today. I knew that 40 minutes would go so quickly. I think we could have gone for another 40 minutes and explored more deeply some of the uh, ways to access teams like this. But it's a it's a beautiful thing that you're doing at the at the Jewish. Congratulations on such a fine team. And thank you so much for participating today. Thank you. Thank you. So many wonderful questions that have come in from the audience. Um, we're missing two of our panel members for the moment, uh, just a, a couple of technical difficulties, but we hope to have them back online soon. But let me start with the first question. I'm sure we'll manage just fine. Is there any form of post-treatment care after surgery and chemo radiation is completed? I find often we are left to figure out the rest on our own. We have such a great team and once it's all said and done, we're left alone. So perhaps uh, Connie, you wanna take this question and share your own experiences here. Um, well, that's when I ended up getting my nurse navigator um, and their role was basically to check in, make sure that I was, um, you know, had certain symptoms uh, kind of in check. You know, they would um, give suggestions on on 
how to manage some of the symptoms. But ultimately, I, yeah, I had to go and find it myself. Um, I ended up, you know, reaching out to to Colorectal Cancer Canada because I felt very alone, and I knew um, I was. I don't want to say spiraling, but it was very challenging because I had what was called, well, what is called LARS, which is what happens after, um, you know, the symptoms that happen after you have your rectum removed, um, you don't function the same. So I went to Colon Canada and asked for some support. And that's how I started um, getting what I needed. And when it wasn't there, they were really open to going, okay, let's figure out how we can get you what you need. Yeah, thank you so much. Natalie, I'm sure you have a lot to say on this subject. Where can people go to get these kind of resources? Although I have to say Colorectal Cancer Canada is a brilliant resource in and of itself. It is, it is a great support uh, network for patients and there's other networks similar that are out there. Um, as Connie mentioned, uh, coming back to your nurse navigator, once we're involved, I always tell my patients, I'm there from the start to the very end. So you can always reach out to your nurse navigator to get some guidance, support, and recommendations on how to manage your symptoms. Um, it's interesting that this is a, it's a very pertinent question. Myself and Dr. Boutros are currently working on a project at the Jewish General about survivorship and unmet needs for patients post-treatment and how and where they can go. And it's about compiling possibly a profile dossier for the patients and their family physicians in the community to help support the patients when symptom management questions come up and they're not sure where to turn to. Great, great, thank you so much. And welcome, Christina. I'm sorry you had some trouble getting on. I'm glad you're here though. I wanna to bridge to the next uh, question, which is, are palliative care, uh, supportive care services available to cancer patients, even at early stages of the disease? What might palliative care look like during earlier stages of colorectal cancer? Question is open to whoever feels most comfortable. Oh, well, in fact, oh. Go ahead, Dr. Madison. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a, you know, this is kind of been a pretty rapid evolution of palliative care without changing its name because the name is a little bit uh, worrisome, even scary to a lot of patients. But it really is supportive care, and that is symptom management, which is after all what we do in palliative care. We we ch we we shift our focus from the tumor to the patient, and focus on symptoms. Now, people that are not worried about their tumor. Uh, or, or in the midst of an effective anti-tumor therapy, still have symptoms that need, need to be managed. It can include pain, nausea, uh, difficulties with eating, maintaining weight, uh, and nutritional status. It could be uh, psychosocial things as well. And those are all the kinds of things that the, the, our supportive care, palliative care team uh, bring into play early on. And so this Move, movement of palliative care up front to early stage, absolutely curable patients uh, is something that is a, a movement that's uh, global and that we uh, were very early in doing um, and mm. are proud of. Yeah, great. Thank you for uh, reinforcing that is new, but it's uh, expanding. Um, I wanted to, uh, here's another question that's come in. Who can a patient talk to if they need help navigating the drug reimbursement process, which we all know is superbly complicated? Um, Natalie, maybe this question uh, can go to you. So at the Jewish General, we have what is called a drug access coordinator, and she works closely with the prescribing doctor, the oncologist, to make sure the facilitate the paperwork is done in a timely manner and that these patients do get access to the medication that they need. Um, I'm also part of that coordination of care. Um, it's a wonderful loop of information and 
patients, once connected through the Drug Access Navigator, are also connected to the support system for those drugs that are being prescribed. So I, I can't speak if every hospital does have one, but I can tell you at ours, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine that uh, is functioning to support our patients. Great. It sounds like a lot of things are working beautifully well at the Jewish in uh, Montreal, your wonderful best practice case. Uh, welcome, Dr. Boutros. I'm sorry you had trouble getting on, but uh, maybe I'm going to ask the question because your timing might be quite perfect on, on the next question, which was, uh, can the surgeon comment on the change of plan to NOM from LAR and how can patients deal with this? Can the yeah, surgeon comment on the change of plan from NOM to LAR? Yes. That's an excellent question. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. So the treatment of rectal cancer is a little bit more nuanced um, and not straightforward compared to the treatment of colon cancer because we have multiple options and because operations on the rectum are a larger operation that impact quality of life a little bit more. So just for everyone in the audience that um, the rectal cancer can be treated with radiation and chemotherapy up front to reduce the tumor so that when we do operate, we remove it all in its entirety. And people have found that, you know, some people, once we come to operate on them, actually have no tumor left. And so we tell them, good news, there's no tumor left, but, you know, your quality of life and your function changes dramatically after a low anterior resection, which is the LAR. And so after a patient typically finishes chemotherapy and radiation, I see them back again and I reassess the impact of the treatment. And sometimes when I look inside, I see no more tumor left and the MRI and the CT scans confirm that. So then we're left in a situation where we can um, choose to operate or not. And it's a difficult decision. Um, of course, if we don't operate, bowel function is better and that is correlated with quality of life for most people, but every person is different. For some people, the anxiety of not knowing whether every little cell is removed, which unfortunately our diagnostic tests right now don't tell us, um, then the anxiety of that will impact quality of life more than the disturbed bowel function. So it's a nuanced decision and we have to talk about it. And usually I meet with patients several times just to discuss the pros and cons because there's no right answer. Um, and each case is very different until we arrive at a right decision for that patient, whether it's better to watch and wait, um, which is the non-operative management, the NOM, or it's better to do the low anterior resection and just be sure that all the cancer is gone um, and deal with the bowel function afterwards. So that's the encapsulated answer. I hope it helps. <laughs> I think it was a beautiful encapsulated answer, very, very clear. We're going to have to end it there. As usual, I'm shocked that 10 minutes goes as fast as it does. I want to thank Connie, Natalie, Dr. Baptiste, Dr. Boutros, and Christina all for uh, participating in this conference and for being here with us to uh, answer all of these questions. For those of you who didn't get your questions answered, please know that the colorectal cancer team is behind the scenes capturing everything. And we'll get back to you with an answer um, as soon as they possibly can. I'd now like to um, introduce our next wellness break. This one is all about getting up and stretching. We know that movement is one of the most important things you can do, and Danny Cohen is going to help us with that. So hope you'll be able to do that, and don't forget to check in on the exhibition booths. Really, there's been so many resources that have been communicated as part of this conference. Go to Colorectal Cancer Booth, click on the file, and you'll find all kinds of information, great information there. Enjoy the wellness break. <laughs>